Hey guys, welcome and ting and ting and ting. I have done several videos on Serbia, right? Serbian history and thing. And I've gotten comments about it. And somebody sent me this video and says, hey, uh, try this one. See if, uh, you know what I mean, you learn more. And uh, I like to listen to the, the history of the people from the people. But it's also good to listen to the history from the people who think they know about those people's history. You understand what I'm saying? But you have to, like, decipher which is propaganda and which is real. And you have to decipher the motives of the people who are creating the videos at the time. You understand what I mean? But in this case here, somebody suggested this. They said, hey, you want a uh, decent history of Serbia? Check this video out. I'm going to go ahead and YouTube it and simmer and see what this history is about. Let's go on. Yeah. Serbia is loved by its visitors due to the great smile and huge heart of its citizens, stunning nature, beautiful cities, gourmet food, and unforgettable entertainment. Serbs love Serbia due to the sense of pride that belonging to one nation gives them, due to its famous history and the belief that the whole world will one day realize all we Serbs deserve is a lot more love and understanding. This is a story of us, our country, since ancient times to the modern. Vinča, near Belgrade, was the heart of the first European urban civilization 9,000 years ago. It was a place in which the first Serbian alphabet was created. Nowadays, the alphabet is built of 20 similar symbols of the Vinčan alphabet, which opens discussions whether the current alphabet was created from the Vinčan and not the Greek, which is contrary to what is being taught in schools today. Geologists have discovered materials from which the Vinčans built their houses and ceramics. They were not just of regular clay, but a mixture of materials, which proves they had highly developed technology. The inhabitants of Vincha were the first to melt metals and make paint out of minerals extracted from the mines on Avala Mountain. The secret of finding ores and melting metals was discovered by the Vincian culture more than 7,000 years ago. Numerous world scientists state that the Vincian culture was the most technologically advanced prehistoric culture in the world. Oh, wow. The archaeological site Lepenski Vir in the Geopak Gorge, situated on the banks of the Danube River, was discovered exactly half a century ago. It was one of the most important discoveries of its kind due to the fact that a prehistoric culture of approximately around 8,000 years old is in question. In the region of Lepenski Vir, people existed for almost 2,000 years. During that time, aside from hunters and gatherers, more organized social economic communities were developed. At the time of the excavation process, seven habitats were discovered along with 136 objects built between 6,500 and 5,500 BC. Its inhabitants, as the first urbanologists and builders in that area, built houses out of wooden construction, leaves, and skins from wild animals. Located inside the homes were fireplaces, a little sacrifice place and stone sculptures that represented their gods. Those sculptures became a recognizing symbol of Lipinski Vir throughout the world and are the oldest artifacts of their kind in Europe. On the territory of present Serbia is the largest part of the front lines of the Roman Empire, an empire that managed to conquer and submit majority of the world in 53 years. Along the Danube line on which Rome was defended for years, a few groups of cities were created which metropolizes even in the ancient times. Among these cities is Simayuna, consisting of 100,000 inhabitants. It's on the grounds of present Serbia. 16 emperors were born, two early Byzantine emperors, including oh. Justin and Justin Yena. The most important of all the kings born in present Serbia is King Constantine the Great, who ruled from maturity until his death at 31 years of age. Both Constantine and his mother, Helena, have been proclaimed as saints by the Orthodox Church. King Constantine the Great made crucial decisions that changed the course of European history, ceasing the exile of Christians and also converting to Christianity himself, which resulted in cementing Christianity as a leading religion. He also founded a city equal to Rome, being Constantinople, nowadays known as Istanbul, 
providing existence of the Roman Empire in the East long after the fall of Rome and long after the Western civilized part of Rome fell. The process of the Slavs inhabiting the Balkan Peninsula began in the 6th century and lasted for 200 years. At the beginning of the 9th century, the first states of the Balkan Slavs were created. Their alphabet was the old Slavic alphabet and their first books were liturgical. The Slavs accepted Christianity in the 9th century. The most ancient history of Serbia up until the times of Nemanjic dynasty was illustrated with constant battles between both Bulgaria and the Byzantines. At the end of the 12th century, Nemanja succeeded by offensive politics to substantially enlarge the Serbian state, strengthen his empire from Kotor up to Sofia with its capital in Rash. Nemanja's youngest son, Rasko, renamed Sava when he became a monk. He was the first Serbian archbishop, educator and writer. As a young man, he left his father's kingdom and went to Sveta Gorj. Later on, his father joined him as a monk named Simeon, and with his help, they created the monastery at Holanda. Wow. After returning to Serbia as an abbot of the monastery, Studenica, and afterwards as the founder and first archbishop of the independent Serbian church, Sava developed a large activity to constitute and develop the church life, elevate the culture, and educate the people. Sava was proclaimed a saint after his death. The monasteries that- You know, you know what, what, what watching this year, what I'm thinking? I'm thinking it's crazy how one group of people pretty much invade an area and they try to wipe out anything resembling them. It's just crazy how that is, isn't it? I mean, that's not just there, it's everywhere. It kind of makes you question history, especially when you have to take into consideration who wrote it and why they write it and why some people are demonized and why some people are uplifted. You understand what I'm saying? Like, a, a perfect example is this, okay? Now, I don't know if you all know who this is there. Like, I guess everybody knows who she is. Beyonce just did a country music song. Country music is basically here. And I'm going to just say it out white people music. That's what they, they say it to be. And several people got on television complaining that she as a black woman is uh, infringing on a, on a white culture. But then when you re look into the history of it, the instrument that's uh, a mainstay in country music, the banjo, is an African uh, 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 invented uh, instrument. So then the slaves had to teach the colonizers how to play it. And they took the slaves' music and made it their own, which kind of happens in, uh, over there too in a certain degree. The, 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 the people who took over brought in their own culture, brought in their own religion and stuff like that, and they circumvent the culture of people who were previously there as a matter of controlling them to a certain degree, you know what I mean? You can say the same thing in the Caribbean too, because Catholicism is really huge there, you know? And here's, here's something that's uh, that's interesting about it, and I thought about this uh, recently, okay? Check this out. In the Caribbean where I'm from, when you talk about religion, it's about peace and love, God's love, that's what you hear 99% of the time in churches. So, this is my own opinion as people who were the underdogs and because of a fear of uprising, they preach the love and peace to sort of subdue the people. But then I come here and it's fire and brimstone and we have to fight this and we have to destroy this and we have to do this in the name of God and, and all of that stuff, you know, and, and pretty much uh, control everybody. So the people that they don't want to uprise and take their own uh, destiny in their hands, they subdue them by teaching them the peace and the love stuff, which I am all for, you understand? Because I think if they teach both sides peace and love, we might have some kind of more of peace. And the other people that they want to stand up and fight and win number one and all that, they teach them the warrior mentality of the, of the Bible and stuff like that. Comment down below. Let me know what you think about that. You know, because I can see that in where it's happening in Africa. To a certain extent, I'm seeing that here, and it's not just religion; it's politics too. You know what I mean? And I'm not knocking religion because it seems like this religion 
teaches a lot of uh, the Orthodox Church teaches a lot of peace and love, you know. But almost everybody that has uh, commented or even sent me emails uh, from that uh, particular religion or, or sector section of religion, they preach a lot of peace and you know goodwill and stuff like that. I'm not hearing the fire and brimstone stuff that I hear. When I'm here, you know, the exclusionary vibe, you know, if you're not this, you can't come here. If you're not that, you can't do this. And if you do come, know your place. You know that kind of vibe? Let's get back in. It's just amazing how history is taught in a way to manipulate the present of the way people think of themselves or the way other people think of them. And that would put, you could put a, a glorified uh, mask on uh, a certain group of people. Or it could put a dehumanizing uh, connotation on the people that they want to keep where they are. That were created by Sava's father became nurseries of literary activities. All of the monasteries are architectural monuments of distinction and beauty, with painted frescoes of which some are proclaimed amongst the highest achievements of European painting from the Middle Ages. Kosovo is Serbia. There are so many Serbian sacred things so that we'll be Serbian even after there will be not be a single Serb there. These are the words of the great poet Matija Bečković. Kosovo is the heart of Serbia and has a similar role as Jerusalem for the Jews. In Kosovo, on Vidovdan, 28th of June 1389, not far from Pristina, the Battle of Kosovo between the Ottoman Empire and Serbian forces occurred. The Serbian forces were led by Prince Lazar, along with his allies, and the Ottomans led by Sultan Murat with his sons Jakub and Bayezid. The Battle of Kosovo is presented as a salvation of Serbia because it emphasized the difference amongst the oppressed Orthodox and Muslim occupiers. The Kosovo battle had a large echo in Europe and temporarily succeeded to stop the Ottoman Empire expanding further in Europe. This... You know, that's another thing I've noticed too here. Right. These days, we really don't see the Muslim faith as occupiers per se. We see them uh, having their own sectional uh, uh, conflicts and stuff, you know, the different uh, tribes that is there that believe in different aspects of the religion. But like they occupying a place like actively, I mean, they, there's places where they have, had a, in Africa, for instance, where Islam is, uh, is, is prevalent. They, they, they have infiltrated there, but uh, mainly, and it's quite possibly because uh, I live out in the western part of the world, and Christianity is it, and being at a disadvantaged minority, which mainly is poor, <laughs> not so much the color of the skin or ethnicity, and I lost my train of thought, but uh, yeah, you have to look at it in that uh, perspective there, you know what I mean? Oh, I absolutely lost my train of thought. Ugh. I think in order to find the truth in what history is, is to, is to look at both sides and go down the middle. Let's just put it that way, in that sense. Comment down below, let me know what you think. Battle for centuries after became a central motive of Serbian folk poetry and the Serbian national identity. The Serbian nation lived under the Ottoman Empire for many centuries. The Turkish sultans divided the conquered states between their warriors and their properties were inhabited by Serbian villages. The people paid taxes and worked without pay. The hardest obligation of all the tax was that paid in blood. Male children were taken every fifth or seventh year to Turkey. They gave them new names, educated them in Turkish spirit and trained them to become Turkish soldiers. Some of the children did not obey by escaping to the forest, becoming rebels, and from there organizing battles and uprising against the Turks. As the years passed, life under the Turks became harder. That kind of life led to numerous migrations of the Serbian population, the largest of which was led by the church patriarch in charge, Arsenija Charnoyevic. The region of Belgrade was under the cruelest rule by the Turkish leaders. The people decided to initiate military resistance against the rule, at the beginning of 1804, a revolt against the Ottoman Empire began. Georgia Petrovic, Kara Georgia, was chosen as the leader of this revolt. The revolt turned into an open uprising against the Ottoman Empire, known as the First Serbian Uprising. Before the end of 1806, almost the entire region of Belgrade was liberated, and the Turks had to retreat from numerous Serban states. It seems like that at that, that time, they'd be doing like 
1800 and like 1850, there seemed to be like a lot of revolts and uprisings. 1804, they started to uh, rise up against their, their Ottoman Empire. I think it's 1833, 18-something, oh my goodness, the Haitian Revolution, the first successful slave uprising that actually stuck, happened, that there was a lot of that going on. If you fast forward it, because they're going to come into modern day times, you fast forward to the 1980s, you know, uh, where there's there so many revolutions in the 80s through South America, through Africa, uh, and in Europe, of course, Romania, 1989, you know what I mean? That there was a lot of uprisings there. It's like one happened and other people go, oh, wait a minute, we could do that too, you know, and there's an uprising happening. Right now, there's not really an, an uprising happening. There's a, a sort of, I won't call it ideological or intellectual uprising, a sort of understanding of how politics are working against people. That is spawning a new uprising, and I don't think it's going to be so much certain groups against certain, and, I, and I'm hoping it's not, I hope it's just people who are struggling to make ends meet day to day going, hey, wait a minute, I am toiling here and I'm not getting anywhere. Time to rise up, you know, and I think it was kind of the same thing that happened in the 80s, and quite possible the same thing that happened back in 1804. I mean, around that early 18, uh, the, the 1800s there, you know, if I want to call that. Let's get back. Serbia participated in World War I, siding with the Allied forces. Today it's well known that the Austro-Hungarian Empire initiated the war using the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the heir to their throne, on the 28th of June in 1914 in Sarajevo as a direct cause to begin the war. He was shot by Gavrilo Princip, a member of the organization Young Bosnia, which sought liberation of Bosnia from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The declaration of war against Serbia initiated a chain reaction amongst all the Allies, resulting in a full-scale world war. The First World War, being the worst world battle of its kind, was concluded by the signing of the Treaty of Versailles on the 28th of June 1919. One of the war strategies of Serbia was uniting Serbs, Croatians and Slovenians. The declaration of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes was announced by the region Alexander Karajorjevic on the 1st of December 1918. World War II was to become the largest war conflict of all time, during which more than 50 million people were killed, approximately 1 million of those in Yugoslavia. Out of all the wars throughout history, this one was unique due to the concentration camps and extermination of entire nations. At the beginning of the war in the divided Yugoslavia, on the territory of self-proclaimed independent state of Croatia, the regime of the Stasi were executed in genocide over Serbs, Jews and Gypsies. At the same time in Serbia, the first European resistance against the fascist state was formed by the Chetnik leader Draža Mihailović. A little afterwards, the communist partisans led by Josip Broz Tito also called for an uprising. The Chetniks and partisans collaborated at the beginning of the war, but due to differing ideals, a civil war started, a war characterized by the suffering of all Serbian people. The movement of the Serbian Chetniks Ravnogora was accepted by the Allies and the government in exile, but later on General Draja was accused of passive resistance of the occupiers and a never proven collaboration with the Germans by communist propaganda. No, you talk about passive uh, aggression, to the, the allies, I um, do believe that's what he says. But the history has taught them not to trust anybody. The way they are treated. So, because it seems like people just turn on them all the time, constantly. Splitting them up, making different countries, trying to like exterminate them from places and, and we put new people in there. And that's according to the history that I'm learning about that area, which, you know, so why would they trust outsiders? Hence, I think the the nationalistic idea, because you know, it's easy to think if you're being attacked by people all the time, it's easy to think that it's you against the world. You know what I mean? So I understand that kind of a mentality that is going on there with a lot of nationalism there. After a fabricated court process held by communists against him post-war. The general was executed in July in 1946, with his burial place even nowadays left unknown. His honor was later reinstated in May this year in Serbia by a court rehabilitation process with his name and war efforts liberated of the collaboration claims. 
1987, the US Congress put forward a bill to erect a statue of Draja Mihailovic in Washington in recognition of the 500 American pilots the general saved during the Second World War. But unfortunately, it didn't pass due to pressure from Yugoslavia. Moreover, he was awarded the Legion of Merit Award by the American President Harry Truman posthumously for his outstanding services in World War II, the highest military award that can be given to a non-American. The largest concentration camp within the territory of ex-Yugoslavia was located in Jasenovac, Croatia, on the coast of the Sava River, discovered soon after the war. It had been confirmed that approximately 700,000 civilians were executed, amongst them up to 20,000 children, simply because they were Serbs, Jews or Gypsies. Each year on the 25th of April, Australia celebrates Anzac Day, its own national day of remembrance of the Allied heroes from Gallipoli up to the modern. The fact that from all the nations of ex-Yugoslavia, only the Serbs are permitted could be constituted acknowledgement that the Serbian nation is not a nation of conquerors and genocide. The international public has been unduly put in sense of historical fault purely on the Serbs for the fall of Yugoslavia and the bloodshed that's followed. The wars led in the last decade of the 20th century and the fall in Yugoslavia is a fact that concerns all of the nations of Yugoslavia. All in all, their historical situations are different and should be studied as such. Today in the world, the fact that it is accepted more and more is that one nation cannot be entirely blamed for the entire Balkan War within the regions of the fallen countries of Yugoslavia. Guilty are the individuals that have been proven as executors of crimes and therefore need to be punished regardless of their nationality. The ethnic cleansing that occurred during the 1990s should not be forgotten where approximately 450,000 Serbs were also executed. However, in 1999, because of world accusations that Serbian forces were executing ethnic cleansing of the Albanians in Kosovo, Serbia once again was accused of being the guilty party alone. Without an approval of the Security Council, on the 24th of March that year, NATO commenced airstrikes against Serbia that lasted for 78 days. During the bombings, infrastructure, agricultural objects, cultural monuments, churches, media centers, and monasteries were all heavily damaged. The damage sustained has been estimated from 30 up to $100 million. The final number of casualties never officially announced, but according to Serbian estimates, could be between 1,200 and 2,500 killed and more than 5,000 injured. The southern Serbian province of Kosovo has been under protection of the United Nations for the past 16 years. During that period, more than 300,000 people have been expelled from Kosovo and Matocia and more than 140 Serbian Orthodox churches and monasteries have been demolished. Fifteen of them were listed as World Heritage Sites. The Serbian nation does not stop sending messages to all that Kosovo and Matocia is a Serbian, and losing a battle in Kosovo will never be the same as losing Kosovo and Matocia as a territory. Times come and go, but our faith is strong. Serbia is a small country, but throughout centuries past it has given birth to a number of great world scientists and scholars. Nikola Tesla was the greatest Serbian genius of all. If I'm lucky enough to accomplish some of my hopes, it will be beneficial for the whole of humanity. If those hopes become reality, the sweetest thought that I will have in my mind is that all was accomplished by one Serb. These were his words. He knew that he would not be understood by his contemporaries, but one day the laws of nature and secrets he discovered would prevail. Albert Einstein, when asked how it felt to be the smartest man alive, was quoted as saying, I don't know, you'll have to ask Nikola Tesla. He died on Orthodox Christmas 1943, poor and in debt in a hotel in New York. The mayor of New York farewelled him with the following words. An inventor has left us, his work will become even greater in time to come. In the pockets of the scientists who left more than 750 protected patents and innovations was only $14. Numerous paintings of the Serbian scientist and patriot Mihailo Pupin, who was one of the 400 most influential citizens of America in his time, even nowadays are utilized in the areas of electronics and telecommunications. His most renowned invention was greatly extending the range of long-distance telephone communication by way of loading coils for which he won the greatest American acknowledgement for inventors, Edison's Golden Medal. He was also a founding member of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which today is known as NASA. Militin Milankovic was a world-known geophysicist, climatologist, astronomer, and founder of the Department of Celestial Mechanics at the University of Belgrade. His reforms of the Gregorian and Julian calendar were accepted in Chadigrad in 1923, 
Moreover, he had created the most precise calendar to date. Not until the development of the quartz and atomic clocks, his theory that the period of the Earth's rotation was inconsistent, was proven and ultimately quantified. Mihailo Petrovich Alas and Mileva Maric Einstein were world famous mathematicians applying their knowledge in areas of technology and innovations. In all cases, scientists with a Serbian background and heritage never forgot their roots. The untouched beauties of Serbia are truly pearls for admirers of nature. Serbia offers many challenges with its high mountain ranges, spacious plains, forest expanses, and stunning caves. It is an ideal place for people with an adventurous spirit. Some plants and animal species that have already vanished from the rest of Europe still survive in the dense forests and rich hills of Serbia. Kopaunik, with 1,500 different types of plants, is the roof of Serbia, but is also the most famous Serbian ski resort. Vernička Banja is the queen of continental tourism and during the 30s had double the amount of tourists from Dubrovnik. The national parks Tara, Fruška Gora oh, and Jerdat each year attract larger numbers of tourists flocking to the Serbian mineral springs which are well known across the whole of Europe. It's no wonder that Robert De Niro thread his travels in Serbia fell in love with the Serbian nation and gave his daughter the name Drina which is a wonderful river streaming through the heart of Serbia. In Serbia, sport is of great significance. Moreover, people identify themselves with the successes of the athletes and their victories. The most popular sports in Serbia are soccer, water polo, volleyball, handball, athletics, and in the past few years, tennis. As successes of the State Alliance of Serbia and Montenegro, the basketball team of Serbia won two gold medals on the World Championships in 1998 and 2002, as well as a silver medal in 2014. The male basketball team won silver medal at the 1996 Olympics. This year, the female basketball team won the European gold medal. Dražen Dalipagic, Dragan Kachanovic, Vlada Divac, Alexander Djordjevic, Predrag Danilovic, Predrag Stojakovic, and Milos Teodosic have been declared the best players in Europe on many occasions. Traditionally, best Serbian football teams are Red Star and Partizan, and the games between these two clubs are called an eternal derby. The greatest success of club football in Serbia occurred in 1991 when Red Star won the UEFA Champions Cup and the Intercontinental Cup. This year in the World Championships in New Zealand, Serbia became the under-20s world champions, defeating Brazil. Serbia's male volleyball team won gold at the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, bronze at the Olympics in 1996, and silver at the 1998 World Championships. Water polo is one of the most prized sports in Serbia at all. The senior men's team have won the world championships four times and the water polo players of Partizan have been European club champions seven times. This year they became world champions again. The male tennis team won the Davis Cup in 2010 and in 2013 were runners up. On the other hand, the female team got in the finals of the Federation Cup in 2012. Most successful female tennis players of Serbia are Anna Ivanovic and Jelena Jankovic. Both of them were first on the world ATP rankings list and have won 28 titles in singles competition between them. The most successful Serbian male tennis player in the world, number one, is Novak Djokovic, who's won 11 Grand Slam tournaments. He holds the record for five trophies won at the Australian Open alone. Jokovic has more than 40 individual titles and is the only Serbian sportsman that's been declared the best athlete in the world. Other great male players include Viktor Trojski, Janko Tipsarovic, Nenad Zemanovic, and the up-and-coming Dusan Lajevic. It is said that each memory is like a shoulder that slips each time you try to support yourself on it. Serbia is a shoulder on which each one of us can count. That is why the love and memories of this country are so beautiful. Okay, okay, I thoroughly in, enjoyed this year. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's such a succinct uh, story of uh, the history of Serbia and things like that. Whoever uh, suggested this video, thank you very much for suggesting it. And uh, we want to keep learning or we want to keep uh, uh, enjoying the history of Serbia. I'll link a video up here so you all could uh, watch it until you understand that I reacted to Serbia. And also have a, a playlist check that out too. But in the meantime, y'all take care of each other, all right? Cool, right?